Good evening. I'm just so blessed and I'm so humbled uh, to be speaking with you tonight. It's such an honor to be in Momi. Did I get that right? <laughs> the first time I got um, to know that I would be coming here. So I was so excited and I went, uh, I live with a host family in Colorado Springs and I told them, you know what? In July, I'll be in Maumi. <laughs> Because in Kenya, we have something called Mau Mau, which um, are the people who fought for our independence. So I thought, oh, because we have Mau Mau, this should be Mau Mi. <laughs> and I was told, oh, no, Nancy, it's Momi. So English is my fourth language. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I'm just glad that I, uh, I get to also learn. It's a learning journey. I speak British English because Britons are my colony and <laughs> coming to learn American uh, has been quite interesting for me. I just, <laughs> I just love it. So allow me to take you a bit to Kenya. Um, I know uh, I have spoken to a few of you that have been to Kenya and it's an honor. When you have a chance to meet a Kenyan or if you get a chance to go to Kenya, you'd want to know one one thing, at least the greeting. So when you meet with people, you say jumbo. So let's try it, jumbo. Thank you so much. <laughs> Anytime you have a privilege of interacting with the Kenyan, just say jumbo and you'll be loved. You'll have the smile, <laughs> you'll have worn them. <laughs> yeah, so um, I was born back in 1986. I'm 29 years old and my mother gave birth to me when she was still living with the parents, so I was born out of wedlock. The reason I'm mentioning this, that's how my life began. I know here in the US, being born out of wedlock is not such a big deal, but in my country and my community, being born out of wedlock was such a big deal. You were treated as an outcast. People felt children born out of wedlock did not belong to the society or the family. And most of the time, most parents used to throw those girls out of their homes. So um, I'm blessed because my grandmother and grandfather gave me an opportunity to live. Maybe I would not be here today, but they accepted my mother and they accepted to take care of me. My middle name is Kinyanzwa. Kinyanzwa was a name given to me by my grandmother, which means the loved one. Jepko H was given to me by my stepfather. When I was the age of two, my mother got married to my stepfather, and he gave me the name Jepko H, which means I was born in the morning at six. We name kids differently, depending with season, depending with the time, and so I was born at six. So anyone between five and, uh, was born between 5 a.m. and eight would be called Jepko H. How many of us would qualify here? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Mary. <laughs> so when my mother got married to my father, my stepfather, was a peasant farmer and he had a hut. It was a grass roof and mud wall and dirt floor. It had two rooms. One was a living room and the other one was a bedroom. In their bedroom they had a very special bed. This bed was made from trees so they had dug on the ground and put two posts, four posts, and then they used bladder, you know, to make the bed. Then they had a mattress on it. And over time, my family grew, and we were six kids. So I have three sisters and two brothers. I'm the second born. Life used to be really, really hard. For the four of us, the two rooms were good for us. But when my family grew and we became eight of us, my two parents and six kids, my father built us two huts. And this time round, there was a bit of an improvement. 
so it had tin roof then mud walls and that floor so we had what we called a main house which had four rooms and then we had a kitchen that had two rooms so i and my sisters used to sleep in our kitchen and my mom and my brothers would sleep in the main house the reason was there wasn't enough room every day i still remember once we were done with our cooking we used to clean our area and then we would lay our mat there and sleep on the floor and the second room that i mentioned in our kitchen used to be a room for the sheep we kept small animals and we would not let them sleep outside because it was insecure because of the weather and wild animals so there was all this order coming from the sheep's room and it was so uncomfortable i can tell you <laughs> and i used to visit so many of my friends in my neighborhood and they had very good beds they had bedrooms and i wished that someday i would have a bed and i would have a bedroom i used to go to a primary school that was two and a half miles away from home and this school was a day school a mixed boys and girls so every morning i used to walk to school two and a half miles then i would come back at around 12 30 for lunch then go back at around one and then come back in the evening so i would walk 10 miles every day and i used to walk barefoot when i look at my toenails <laughs> they are colored right now <laughs> but all my toenails re had to regenerate because i used to knock my toes on the stones and it, it would come off i would injure myself i had one pair of shoes at the age of six one day i was in grade two that is back in 1992 i'd just come back from school one evening together with my sister in the evening it was around six and it was getting dark then we have this visitor come to visit us at home and it was someone from our church we used to go to a baptist church it was called college baptist church so i used to go there every sunday for sunday school so we had someone called rogers mwalili who came and i knew him and we were summoned to our living room. I used to know when my parents summoned us to the living room, there was trouble. So this time around, I didn't know what we had done, I and my sister. So they summoned us to our living room and there's a visitor there and told us sit there. And then the guy started questioning us. And he had this form and you know, he was feeling. When he finished, he told us on Saturday, please come at the church. And he explained, you're gonna get friends. And these friends are Americans. In Swahili, how we refer to Americans is mzungu. Any anybody with white skin, we call them mzungu. Mzungu is singular. If you're many, we say wazungu. So for me, I was so excited that, wow, I'm gonna get a mzungu. I expected when I would go to the project on Saturday, I would meet who? My Mzungu. So I go there on Saturday. And I was so curious. I was waiting to see my friend. And I was told that this friend lived so far away in America. And she was called Kenda Hall. And she was going to sponsor me. And that she would be writing me letters and I would be receiving pictures. And as a little kid, I was asking them, am I ever going to, uh, is she coming to visit me? And they would say, yes, of course, she will come at some point. So during that time, we didn't have a curriculum. What we used to do uh, is I would go to school Monday to Friday because that's how our education system is. And then I would go to Compassion Project every Saturday. And I was enrolled there with my elder sister. I have a stepsister. So... We used to go there every Saturday, and I was so excited to go there. I always looked forward to Saturday mornings. The reason being, I would go and 
I would have a chance to have friends and play. It was just play and play and then eat and eat really good meals. We used not to eat meat. Meat would be cooked at home when we had special occasions. It was either Easter, it was either Christmas, or we had special guests. But I used to go to Compassion Project on Saturday and they would serve us with meat, beef stew or fish stew. They would give us peanuts, they would give us uh, mandazi, which is a form of cake that is made from wheat flour and it's uh, baked. They would give us juice and biscuits. And then sometimes they would give us fruits. I would not eat my fruit. I used to hide it in my bag so that I would go and share with my siblings. And this was just so special. And besides that, you know, I wouldn't be made to work so hard. Because I knew staying home, if I was home on Saturday, if I didn't go to Compassion Project, I was made to work so hard. We would go to the farm and, you know, dig or, I would have to fetch water, and I had to carry 10 liter jerry can on my head. And we used to fetch water from the river, which was so far away, and I never loved that. If I was not doing that, I was taking care of the kettle. If you're not doing that, you are at least doing something. Our parents would not stand us just to see us play or just sit there. You had to be busy. And I used to feel like this is just harassment. You know, I want to go and play with my friends. They're not giving me that chance. But in compassion, I got that. And so I would never miss to go to my compassion project. I valued the first gift I was given in my compassion project. When I went there for my first Saturday, I was in my civilian clothes. Then, before we left for home, I was given a good news Bible. Bibles were something that was meant for parents. My mom or my dad would not allow me to touch their Bible. They thought, you are going to tear my Bible or datify it. So for me as a child to be given a good news Bible, I mean, that was so awesome. It was the best gift they gave me. I, would, I, I remember when I was going home, I would flip through the pages and I would stop and show those other kids that are not in compassion that, wow, this is what they've given us. This is what my friend from America has sent and I'm told there's more yet to come. I never spoke English. At grade two, I was speaking my two tribal language, which is Luya, which is my mom's, and then Kalenjin, my dad's, and Swahili. My first letter that I wrote to my sponsor was in Swahili. And so the only thing I afforded to do was drew something that looked like a church. I, I don't know if the picture can be pulled up. That was me when I joined Compassion in 1992. My sponsor made me a very special thing, a photo book, and I extracted that from that book for our journey of sponsorship. That's my first letter. I afforded to draw that church, and I wrote my name. The rest of the information was written by my project worker, who was Rogers Mwalili. And when you look at that, my why was even facing a different direction. I was still learning how to write. <laughs> So here I am, I've been given a good news Bible that's been written in English. I value it, and yet I can't read. It became my motivation to want to learn English, to want to know. And so every Saturday I would go, despite the playing, despite eating good meals, they used to teach us about God. They used to teach us subjects that I was doing in school. So I was very sharp. I was ahead of the teacher sometimes because I had been taught by the part-time teachers. Then by the time I was in school, I felt, wow, that's pretty easy. I was grasping and understanding more. And then I would sneak my Bible to school. As a child, my first verse was to learn was Psalms 119 verses 11, which says, in my heart, I have kept your word so that I may not sin against you. That was what was used to punish me, or any child that was in my compassion project. If you ever did wrong, 
you were asked to recite Psalms 1911. And we would say it, and then they would ask you, do you, do you, do you realize you have gone against the word of the Lord? Do you realize you've done wrong? And we would accept, and I would take punishment. But it was a good way to teach us. It was a good foundation that I value. They made me know God. At the age of nine, I gave my life to Christ. It is the best thing that happened to me. When they asked us, how many of us want to receive Christ? I was among them. I was so little, and they were supposed to go and baptize us in a river. Then they said, no, you will drown. I said, how you will do it, I don't know, but you just have to do it because all my friends are doing it. And I cried so much, and my pastor agreed to do it. He did not know he was planting a seed and he was beginning, it was the beginning of my transformation. All the times I wrote my sponsor, I used to write her a verse. And I never ever wanted to repeat the same verse. Because to me, I wanted to show her that I was growing spiritually, I was growing physically, and I was doing well in school. My first letter that I received from Kenda, she talked about so many things. She talked about her family, she talked about her pets. But what was so outstanding, I have the copy of that later <coughs> with me. Um, here with me are copies of the letters Kenda ever wrote me. Some of them are, you will see, I, I show these. I was not neat, I was so dirty because of all the dirt and mud and everyone wanted to touch the letter and read. They look dirty, but I've kept them as a, you know, because they were what was valuable to me. And so this is the first letter Kenda wrote me in 1992. And what was so outstanding in this letter was she told me, Nancy, I would love to tell you how important it is to pray and read the Bible. I spend time with God praying each morning. It makes me happy and gives me strength for the day. I thank God for you, and I'm so glad we're going to be friends. Keep praying and know God. I love you, Kenda. I wanted to know who this God Kenda was talking about. She kept on encouraging me. And then those three words, I love you. I didn't know what to do with those words. They were so big to me. No one had ever told me that they loved me. And I knew it was a guilt thing to say the word, I love you. I knew it could only be said to, by people who were intimate. So when the, it was read to me and they told me, I, I said, what does she mean? Over time, I came to realize what this love was. I came to realize there's love, there's different types of love. It made me value myself. It made me realize there is so much that I meant a world to someone. Kenda would tell me, you're so beautiful. I never ever believed that I was beautiful, no. Because I used to be so skinny and dark. Maybe <laughs> color has improved because I've grown. <laughs> And people used to tell me, you, you're so ugly. And I believed them that I was ugly. Many girls were struggling with bleaching their skin. I started believing that I was so beautiful when I got to college. Kenda had written so many times to me that I was beautiful. I used to go to the mirror and look at myself and I asked myself, what is this beauty that she's talking about? Yet I'm just dark and I'm nothing. I'm so worthless. Those are words that came from people including my relatives. And they wished me nothing but failure. Some of them wished me failure. Or oh, she's a kid born out of wedlock. Living with a stepfather was really hard. My stepfather was alcoholic. He was abusive and I feared my stepfather. Whenever he used to come home, we used to go and hide. 
because we knew whether we were in trouble or not, we would be punished. They used to tell him, this is not your child. Why do you have to raise her? One day she'll get an education, she'll get married, and it is the biological father that will claim that. <coughs> but I have to say this, despite my father being abusive, despite his alcoholism, God be with his soul, I still love him. He still never believed those people. He still gave me a chance to be his daughter. My father would make us sit down every evening and listen to BBC radio. I started knowing about the world at a young age. And he used to say, my kids are international. I did not know what that meant. I wasn't sure whether I would afford to go to college or afford to live well, but that is what he used to say. So we would listen to BBC radio, then he would conduct an interview. And you had to get it right. You know, it helped me to know countries. It helped me to start thinking beyond Kenya, beyond my village. He used to tell me, my daughter, mathematics, chemistry, biology, and physics are the easiest subjects on earth. And I believed him. And I did all the sciences. When I joined high school, I was the only student who did physics. And I did so well in it. My mean score was the mean score for the school. People had branded us children of an alcoholic. And they used to say nothing good would become of and uh, those kids. I saw no hope. Thank God for my sponsors. Because of them, I knew I would go to school. For the very first time, I went to a boarding school when I joined my grade nine. I went to a boarding school because compassion would pay for my school fees. I had done so well, and I had qualified to join a boarding school, a girl's school, and I was able to do that. While in high school, I work, worked so hard. I wanted to become a news anchor. I wanted to do something that was related to communication, which is something I never did. But when I was, when, I was to join university. I had done well in high school and my parents decided, you have to go to university and you have to go and do mathematics and chemistry. You have to be a high school teacher. I never wanted that. I never wanted it. I tried to, re to object and they told me, if you don't agree to what we say, then there's no university. So I had to oblige and I told them, okay, mom and dad, I'm gonna do this. But the moment um, I have graduated, allow me to do whatever it is I wanted to pursue. And they agreed to it, thinking that I would, you know, in the course of my training, I would be passionate about teaching. That would never change. <laughs> so once I graduated in 2009, unfortunately, my father had died. My stepfather died in 2006. I come from a very conservative community that practices a lot of traditions. One of it is a passage of right for the boys. And what they do, they circumcise them and they have to live in a forest for five weeks. So I have two brothers. Caleb was born in 1990 and Humphrey 1992. They follow each other. So when Caleb was in grade 11 and Humphrey in grade nine, in Kenya, we say in forms, so from one and from three. <laughs> they had to be taken for the passage of right. In the, in the meantime, my father was so sick. He started ailing in July, and we took him to hospitals. 
all they diagnosed was pneumonia. Yet he had become mad. He had lose, lost his memory. He was doing very funny things. He didn't know what he was doing. He didn't know what he was speaking. For five months, it was extremely hard for us. So when they went to go through circumcision, they left my father in a critical state. Upon their second week there, my father died. Tradition dictates that they would not be brought home. And yet we were so poor we could not even afford mortuary expenses. So guess what? We buried my father in the absence of my brothers. It is still hard. They never understood why we did that. They hated my mom when they came back. We buried him on 11th of December and they came back on 28th. I thought that was the end of the road for my family and me. I was in university in my second year. I asked God so many questions. I doubted God. It was hard to feel his presence at that particular moment. And yet, he was there with us. And yet, he had a plan for us. A lot has changed, and God has been faithful to my family. I really celebrate him. Jason, Kendall would later be married, and he, she has a family. She has four kids, three biological and one adopted. Jay told me when my father died, Nancy, in me, you have a father. I am miles away from you, but I love you, my daughter, and I'll be there for you. They have been my motivation. They have been my source of strength. They sponsored me for 17 years. They saw me through leadership development program. I graduated with my degree in education. I would later get a job and go and do public relations management, a postgraduate diploma. Then I would be employed as an assistant researcher with a farm called Nature Kenya that does environment and wildlife conservation. I've been able to pay for school fees for my siblings. Today I celebrate God. Of the six of us, four of us have gone to university. Isn't God amazing? Humphrey would do so well in school, and God opened the door. He got a full scholarship to study in Turkey, Istanbul Technical University. He's doing telecommunication engineering. He's graduating next year. Caleb is doing a Bachelor of Development Studies in a Kenyan university called Jomo Kenyatta University. And Joanna, our last born, is doing social work a degree, she's in her third year. My mom, something good happened to her. When my father died, she was so young, she was 43. And people thought she would remarry, people thought she would not make it, she was a housewife. My mom would let her go to a theological college. She graduated and she's a pastor. She's a pastor of a Baptist church, the same church that had my Compassion Project. And she's a patron of a Compassion Project. I celebrate God. Out of an alcoholic family, the Lord would change lives. She's not in a mad world house anymore. Mm -mm. She's in a brick world house, complete with electricity. God has sustained us. My relationship with my mother changed and that of my siblings. Because my mom used to be abused so much, because she used to be, to be beaten by my father and go through a lot of distress, she never valued us. But today, we are the best thing. We are what matters to her. We are enjoying a relationship with her. I wish my father was alive, but I know he's in a good place. I know he celebrates us. I love God, and I love my sponsors to beats.
what started as friendship, I would write Dear Jason and Kenda Hall, would later be a relationship that ha has turned to be mom and dad. I don't call them by names. When I call them, I ask, hey mom, hey dad. Before I make any major decision, I consult with them. I ask them, what do you think about this? They are my sense of direction. They are my motivation. The reason as to why I stood strong was because of the words they wrote me. It's because of the love they showed me. I have never felt genuine love than before. Today I'm one among the people who uses the word I love you so much on people because I know what that means. God has blessed me. It never stopped by us just going to university, us just getting a good house. I bought myself a very wonderful bed when I got my first job. <laughs> it's, when I came to the US, I gave it to a friend of mine as a special gift. It was my best valued thing. I never stopped in postgraduate diploma. I would later go for my master's in project planning and management. And before I came here, that was what I was doing. I have one more semester to go. And so I'm going back to Kenya sometime in October. And I'm going back to school in November. And I'll do my last exam in February. Then I'm, I'll do my project and graduate next year. And what I celebrate is that I can work and sponsor myself, that I can pay all these. That poor kid, that packet in 1992 is a life because of that wonderful family in Oklahoma City. I love them and I love you people in here today. I know you are sponsoring. You may not have met those families. You may not have met those kids. But on their behalf, I want to say thank you. You are changing not just one life. You are changing the world. You are changing communities and you're changing countries. I sponsor a little girl called Ineza Divine in Rwanda. She's six years old. And I'm so excited to go and visit this girl next year. God has blessed me. What else do I need in this life? To trust him. To love him. Thank you for loving those kids so well. Thank you for being a sense of hope. It is these letters that I still read to date and feel encouraged. These, the verses that are in these letters. I sit and pick my phone and talk to my sponsors. A girl who would barely speak English can speak English and would even come to US one day and spend an Easter with my sponsors. Pull up that picture with my sponsors. That was me graduating. That's Kenda during my graduation in 2009, my LDP graduation. I was in Oklahoma this April, and we went for a gymnast uh, meet. Her youngest daughter is a, gymnast, is a gymnast, so I got a chance to be there. And that is Kenda's family. Jay, Kenda, Caleb, Hena, and Rebecca, the little one, they adopted her from China. That family over there made a difference in me. This was a third year student investing in me. God has blessed us. And I am speaking a word of blessing to each and every one of you. If you've not sponsored, you may want to do it. It is such a blessing. It is such an honor. I'm not st stopping at one child. I'm praying that God gives me enough grace and blessing to do it Next year, I want to pick a boy. I wish I can sponsor as many kids as I can. But I just want to tell you, you are very special people. Keep writing those kids. 
they love to hear from you. How else would I know that I was a beautiful lady? Until those words sunk. I just don't want to do a master's. I want to do a PhD. I always want to keep doing more. I don't want to limit myself. As I go back to Kenya, I want to go and work with the youths and I want to work with the women. I want to encourage them. My country is a developing nation. I know someday we're gonna be like the US. I want to be a part of that change. I want to be a part of that transformation. God bless you. God bless you so much. And I just love you. Thank you. Thank you.